From the beginning, there was purpose behind forced schooling. Purpose which had nothing to do with what parents, kids, or communities wanted. Instead, this grand purpose was forged out of what a highly centralized corporate economy and system of finance bent on internationalizing itself was thought to need. That, and what a strong centralized political state needed too. School was looked upon from the first decade of the 20th century as a branch of industry and a tool of governance. For a considerable time, probably provoked by a climate of official anger and contempt directed against immigrants, social managers of schooling were remarkably candid about what they were doing. In a speech he gave before businessmen prior to the First World War, Woodrow Wilson made this unabashed disclosure. We want one class to have a liberal education. We want another class, a very much larger class of necessity, to forego the privilege of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific, difficult, manual tasks. By 1917, the major administrative jobs in American schooling were under the control of a group referred to in the press of that day as the Education Trust. The first meeting of this trust included representatives of Rockefeller, Carnegie, Harvard, Stanford, the University of Chicago, and the National Education Association. The chief end, wrote Benjamin Kidd in 1918, was to, quote, impose on the young the ideal of subordination. At first, the primary target was the tradition of independent livelihoods in America. Unless Yankee entrepreneurialism could be extinguished, at least among the common population, the immense capital investments that mass production industry required for equipment weren't conceivably justifiable. Students were to learn to think of themselves as employees competing for the favor of management, not as Franklin or Edison had once regarded themselves, as self-determined free agents. Only by a massive psychological campaign could the menace of overproduction in America be contained. That's what important men and academics called it. The ability of Americans to think as independent producers had to be curtailed. Certain writings of Alexander Inglis carry a hint of schooling's role in this ultimately successful project to curb the tendency of little people to compete with big companies. From 1880 to 1930, overproduction became a controlling metaphor among the managerial classes, and this idea would have a profound influence on the development of mass schooling. I know how difficult it is for most of us who mow our lawns and walk our dogs to comprehend that long-range social engineering even exists, let alone that it began to dominate compulsion schooling nearly a century ago. Yet, the 1934 edition of Elwood P. Coverley's Public Education in the United States is explicit about what happened and why. It has come to be desirable that children should not engage in productive labor. On the contrary, all recent thinking is opposed to their doing so. Both the interests of organized labor and the interests of the nation have set against child labor. The statement occurs in a section of public education called a new lengthening of the period of dependence, in which Cubberdly explains that the coming of the factory system has made extended childhood necessary by depriving children of training and education that farm and village life once gave. With the breakdown of home and village industries, the passing of chores, and the extinction of the apprenticeship system by large-scale production with its extreme division of labor, an army of workers has arisen, said Coverley, who know nothing. Furthermore, modern industry needs such workers. Sentimentality could not be allowed to stand in the way of progress. According to Coverley, with much ridicule from the public press, 
The old book subject curriculum was set aside, replaced by a change in purpose and a new psychology of instruction, which came to us from abroad. The last mysterious reference to a new psychology is to practices of dumbed-down schooling common to England, Germany, and France, and three major world coal powers other than the United States, each of which had already converted its common population into an industrial proletariat. Arthur Calhoun's 1919 Social History of the Family notified the nation's academics what was happening. Calhoun declared that the fondest wish of utopian writers was coming true. The child was passing from its family into the custody of community experts. He offered a significant forecast that in time we could expect to see public education designed to check the mating of the unfit. Three years later, Mayor John F. Hyland of New York said in a public speech that the schools had been seized as an octopus would seize prey by an invisible government. He was referring specifically to certain actions of the Rockefeller Foundation and other corporate interests in New York City, which preceded the school riots of 1917. The 1920s were a boom period for forced schooling, as well as for the stock market. In 1928, a well-regarded volume called A Social Psychology of Education claimed, it is the business of teachers to run not merely the schools, but the world. A year later, the famous creator of educational psychology, Edward Thorndike of Columbia Teachers College, announced, academic subjects are of little value. William Kirkpatrick, his colleague at Teachers College, boasted in Education and the Social Crisis, the whole tradition of rearing the young was being made over by experts.